Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and welcome to episode 1 of my new series, Seismic Data, a stake through the heart of Flat Earth. Regular viewers of the channel will have noticed that I haven't produced any content for ages. That's been due to a combination of not feeling that well, but also not feeling that I have anything to contribute to any of the conversations going on. I've been forced to reconsider my position recently because it's become clear that I haven't done a sufficiently good job of explaining exactly how seismic data flat out kills the concept of a flat Earth. So this series is an attempt on my part to rectify those shortcomings. So let's just consider a simple medium. Could be water, could be air, could be solid Earth. And let's apply some form of impulse to it, indicated here by the star. The energy imparted to the medium by the impulse will then radiate away from the focus of the impulse. As long as the material properties of the medium are uniform, the energy will radiate away in a circular or spherical wavefront centered on the point at which the impulse was applied. This is a pretty well understood concept. We're all very familiar with the way sound works or the way ripples move across a pond. It's pretty intuitive physics. But to get a more detailed understanding of what's going on, we're going to have to zoom in. So let's consider a very narrow cylinder of material along which this energy is radiating. Looking at the cylinder side on, there are two classes of impulse that can be applied to the cylinder to generate a wave. One impulse applies a force parallel to the direction along which the cylinder radiates. The other class applies a force that is perpendicular to the direction in which the cylinder radiates. In this episode, we're going to focus on the first case where the impulse is parallel to the axis of the cylinder. In this case, the energy travels as a P wave or a pressure wave. As the wave moves down the cylinder, it kicks each material element into the material element neighboring it, and this allows the energy to propagate. Because of their mode of propagation, pressure waves are able to travel reasonably fast and are able to travel through fluid media such as gases or liquids. The wave propagation is slightly complicated if the medium is compressible, but the general principle remains the same. Again, we are fairly familiar with this style of wave from the propagation of sound through air, but the most spectacular examples of this class of wave are associated with explosions. The larger the explosion, the more spectacular the example. We're going to return to the case of volcanically induced atmospheric pressure waves in a later episode. Anyway, we now have enough basic understanding to return to the central question. From what we've discussed so far, it's pretty obvious that on a flat Earth, seismic energy would radiate outwards from the epicenter until it either hit some form of obstruction or it passed away to infinity, whichever brand of insanity the flat Earther prefers. In a case of a spheroidal body, the situation is more complicated. For the purposes of this illustration, I'm going to assume that the epicenter is at the top of the sphere, though for the benefit of any flat earthers who happen to be watching, there is no top and bottom to Earth. Down is towards the center of Earth. On the left, we have a top-down view from a point just above the epicenter, and on the right, we have a top-down view from a point just above the antipode to the epicenter. This is the point on the opposite side of the sphere from the epicenter. Whereas inevitably on a flat Earth, the seismic energy must either reach the edge of the Earth or pass on to infinity, in a spheroidal Earth, there is no escape. The energy must remain trapped within the Earth or at the Earth's surface. We see that the energy will radiate away from the epicenter and converge on the antipode. This will happen regardless of where the epicenter is and regardless of where the antipode is. This is just a schematic diagram. It doesn't take into account the effects of ellipticity, attenuation, anisotropy, or variations in wave velocity. But it clearly illustrates the broad pattern that we should expect to see in radiation of seismic energy if the Earth is spheroidal. The energy should arrive first at the epicenter and then radiate outwards until converging on the antipode. Okay, so now we've got two hypotheses, two predictions, and they disagree. So what does the data say? Well, for this comparison, we're only interested in the first arrivals. So we can look at a series of seismograms at a particular distance away from a test event, and we can determine when those first P waves arrive. This example series of seismic records here gives an indication of how this is done. There are multiple public repositories of seismic data in which this process has already been done for you, which is super convenient for me because I'm really lazy that way. So what I'm going to plot up here is just the P wave arrival times after the Macquarie Rise earthquake of December 23rd, 2004. 
On the left hand side of the figure is an azimuthal equidistant projection with its center above the epicenter of the earthquake. On the right is the traditional azimuthal equidistant projection with its center above the North Geographic Pole. And yes, I'm perfectly well aware that most flat earthers have disavowed the AE map, but in this particular instance it's going to be extremely useful, so let's stick with it. So we're picking up the action at three minutes after the earthquake, and the new arrivals are marked with blue circles, and older arrivals are marked with increasingly pale red circles. We're stepping forward in time in increments of 15 seconds. The geographic propagation of the seismic energy is hampered somewhat because the distribution of seismic stations is not uniform. Nonetheless, we can see a pattern emerging in the map on the left. The more arrival time data we collect, the clearer it becomes that the seismic energy is radiating away from the epicenter in an approximately circular wavefront. The circular pattern becomes particularly striking as the wavefront hits the west coast of the United States where there is a dense network of seismic stations. Turning our attention to the map on the right, it is also clear that the seismic energy is converging on the antipode in a circular pattern, exactly as predicted in the spheroidal model. At a little after 1000 seconds after the event, we start to notice a dramatic slowdown in the rate of new arrivals as we have entered the shadow zone of Earth's core. We will discuss this in more detail in a later episode. We observe exactly the same pattern of seismic energy dispersion no matter where the earthquake is or where the antipode is. We see propagation of seismic energy away from the epicenter, convergence on the antipode, and a dramatic slowdown of new arrivals as we get closer and closer to the antipode. And this pattern has been reliably and repeatedly observed for many tens of thousands of seismic events. And we observed these tens of thousands of seismic events with many thousands of seismic stations. And in every single instance, our observations comport with the spheroidal model and not with the flat earth model. So that's about where I'm going to call it today. The takeaway message here is that if earth were spheroidal, we would expect the energy to radiate away from the epicenter and converge on the antipode. In fact, this is observed to happen for each and every seismic event. Meanwhile, there is simply no physically plausible mechanism by which these observations could be explained on a flat Earth. Observable reality is utterly consistent with a spheroidal Earth and completely inconsistent with a flat Earth. Anyway, that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate and I hope to see you next time.